Hello everyone, welcome to Rational Science, directly from Frankfurt, Germany. And uh, we're the only site on the internet that does physics. What does everybody else do? Well, they do mathematics. What is mathematics? Mathematics is irrational explanations, irrational mechanisms, physical mechanisms. And what is irrational? Well, irrational means you're going to be moving concepts around. You know, some people wave the wave, other people transfer energy, others excite the feel, and then others, they bend time. Ooh, scary stuff. <laughs> that's what they do, and that's how they explain the workings of the universe. We don't do that here. Here we do it with objects. And today we're going to be talking about a fellow, and his name, a gentleman who uh, writes profusely for Quora, the question and answer site. His name is Victor Toth. We'll be talking about him. And yes, he's a mathematician. He does everything by magic. Uh, but the important thing about him is that he passes on what he learned throughout his life uh, regarding um, the establishment. He's, um, I guess, an advocate for the establishment. Uh, in order to analyze him, we have to go back 5,000 years. Okay? Well, that's where we have to start. And why do we have to go back 5,000 years? Well, here it is. Uh, we have this uh, god. And he was uh, Toth, I guess that's how you pronounce it, Toth, Toth. And he was the god of science, the god of math, okay? And that's when they started doing, I don't know if that's where they started because Sumerians probably beat them by a mile, but this was a good place to start for um, all kinds of uh, mathematics. Uh, remember geometry's measurement of the land. They constructed buildings, especially the pyramids, etc. And so this is where, uh, you know, uh, mathematics was uh, fine-tuned, okay? They, they kept fine-tuning it from... Uh, millennia to millennia. Okay? That's what happened. Okay, and um, it looks like uh, 5,000 years later we have this gentleman and he resuscitated. He came, uh, I think it's the, the same God, somehow came alive again. His name is Victor Toth. Okay? Um, and he claims he's a part-time physicist. Okay, good. And he writes profusely again on, um, uh, what is it, on uh, Quora, question and answer site. And this is what he says in one of his uh, articles. He says, I am mostly self-taught. I won or finished near the top in several national math championships, championships in Hungary. Yeah, but the issue is um, the fact that he got a gold medal, you know, at the Olympics. He got a, or, you know, does that mean he, because he won a beauty contest, that's, that's why he's a scientist or a physicist? You know, he's talking about math here, okay? And the question is whether math is physics and physics is math. And he goes further and he says, uh, physics, the science of tangible, measurable things. And that's going to be funny that he mentions that because, you know, what do you mean tangible and measurable things? I mean, he's going to be talking about dark matter, which is neither tangible or measurable itself. He can measure the, maybe the stars around the galaxy. Certainly, he cannot measure the dark matter. He can't, and it, certainly it's not tangible. And certainly you cannot measure or uh, touch uh, a black hole, a singularity of a black hole, or, or even the event horizon. So what does he mean that physics is the science of tangible, measurable things? And maybe that's why he's a part-time physicist. He's already got it wrong from the start, maybe, you know? Anyways, he says, learning modern physics is hard. I'm still struggling with many concepts. Yeah, I, I totally agree with him. I think he, he's struggling with many concepts, and we're going to see that today. But he gives us a recommendation to people who, like him, are mostly self-taught. And he says, don't try to rewrite, improve, or replace a theory just because you haven't made the effort to understand it thoroughly. Okay, that's, I think, a good advice. Okay? As my example shows, meaning self-taught, right? Um, the academic establishment won't reject you just because you are an outsider. What you do has to make sense. It's interesting that he says that. Um, maybe the issue here is that because he agrees with the establishment, they haven't kicked him out even though he doesn't have a degree. He's self-taught. That means he doesn't have a degree, which is very, very important in mathematics. And so he's got a downplay, you know, the, the fact that he's self-taught, but at the same time, he says, look, if you're an outsider, uh, don't go in there and start kicking, you know, the bucket, the, uh, the trash cans and everything and saying, you guys are all wrong. And he says, try to understand the theory. So essentially what he's saying is that because he agreed with everything the establishment proposes, then uh, he's accepted into the club. And, uh, and, and that way it's easy. No, no different. I mean, it's, imagine if, if I go into, let me put this over here. Imagine if, uh, if, if I go to the, uh, Catholic Church, you know, to the Vatican, and say, oh, I believe in God, and, you know, uh, and I pray every day, and, you know, I love the Virgin, and all that good stuff, and I believe in angels, and Jesus, and, you know, the whole works, 
and they're going to accept and say, come here as my son, you know, they're going to accept me. But if I go in there and say, look, you guys are all crazy. You know, there is no God. Forget the virgin and all that fancy stuff. Why well, don't think they're going to accept me? <laughs> and so this guy is not telling us anything new in that sense. You know, what is he saying? He's just saying that he bowed down to the establishment. He accepts the establishment. And that's why they accepted him. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, that's not fair. <laughs> okay. But he says, I desperately hope that in another article that I don't spread falsehoods as a result of being unaware of my own ignorance. We hope so, too. Okay. Okay, so that's the starting point. Uh, how much does uh, Mr. Toth know about uh, physics? I mean, he says he's a part-time physicist. I hope so. You know, I mean, it doesn't matter if he studied or not. That's not important. Important is what he says. Okay. And so, you know, I checked a couple of his articles. I didn't check them all. I mean, he's got a lot. He's got like 9,000 articles. He's uh, quite popular there. Okay. And uh, I checked a series of articles that are of interest to me. Okay. And one of them was electricity. What is the nature of electricity? And uh, I don't find them there. You know, uh, here's what is electricity. And you see all these questions that people post in Quora. And you would think that after 9,000 plus articles that he wrote, most of them on uh, so-called physics related subjects, you would think that at least he would have answered one or two of these. And I haven't found him. Maybe, maybe he's there. Maybe I'm, you know, uh, overlooking something. But I haven't found him tell me the, uh, the nature of electricity. Okay. And so what can I say? Uh, I didn't find it. And maybe you guys are better than me at this and can look it up. But I was not able to find it. And the same thing happened with magnetism. Okay. He um, uh, hasn't answered a single uh, article or question related to the nature. What is magnetism? How does a magnet attract another? I don't see them there. And you would think that this is like kindergarten stuff that you know, people want to know these things. And one of the first questions you want to answer is, this is what electricity is. This is what magnetism is. This is how it's done. This is that invisible world in there. This is how a magnet attracts another. I mean, this is kindergarten stuff. We, we learned this in the first week of physics. And this guy can't give us, you know, a, an explanation. I mean, I don't see him there, at least. Uh, maybe I missed an article. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, anyone can is willing to correct me. I'm willing to apologize if... If it was me that missed the article that says this is what a magnet what what, um, what magnetism is and how a magnet attracts another this is what electricity is right I, I need to know that and uh, I don't see him there and so you know it, to me it was strange that he writes over nine thousand articles and he didn't address those two issues that's just me okay and um, here we have him on light is light made up of photons the only one really I could find maybe he's got a couple more I don't know but. Uh, but I looked at it and I said, okay, let's see what he says about light, okay? Does he know what light is? And uh, since he came up with this question and says, yes, what we call light is, a, is the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, waves, radiation, rays. Those are the words he used. And uh, yeah, the problem is there is no physical object called waves. There is no physical object called radiation. And there's no physical object called rays. So to say that light is a wave, light is radiation, light is a ray, He's saying light is a concept. All these are concepts. None of these are physical objects, standalone physical objects. Okay. So, um, yeah, he can't tell me what light is, at least in, the, in that sentence. Okay. It's not there. And he said light is electromagnetic radiation. Again, no such thing as radiation. Photons are the quanta of electromagnetic waves in the quantum theory. Okay. Photons. What are photons? Light, therefore, consists of photons. Okay. So you go down the rabbit hole and you look for the photon. And the photon says a type of elementary particle. Packet of energy. Those are some of the things you'll find out there. And you get, go deeper into the rabbit hole and it says particle. What is a particle, right? Probability amplitude, wave function. <laughs> uh, so when you get down to the, you know, to the end of the onion, when you keep peeling, 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 you find nothing there. So yeah, we don't know what light is. And uh, here's a, an analogy for what he's saying there. Okay, I take this as an analogy. Uh, Klingon comes over and asks, what is a cat? And so um, Mr. Toth here says, a cat is an animal. Okay, what is an animal? I mean, he comes from another planet, right? Please have pity on him. Huh? And he said, and uh, Toth would answer, it's an animal is all love. Okay, what is love? It's an equation, numbers and variables. <laughs> and so the Klingon says, okay, so a cat is ultimately a bunch of numbers? And he said, well, you have to go to college to really understand it, okay? And those are the type of answers these people do. They always leave you hanging in the air because they never answer the question. That's the point. 
Okay, so if like Mr. Toth says here, light is made of photons, and then photons turns out that are made of concepts of love, of uh, information, or who knows when. If if it's made out of concepts, well, what is light? Then light is nothing. It's a concept. Okay, uh, I mean not, not the notion of light, but I mean, what is it made of? I mean, here you, you talk about uh, cases like, you know, the, uh, what is it, the photoelectric effect? And they talk about, Einstein talked about this, he got his Nobel for that, that the electron bead uh, is kicked out of its, you know, out of its atom by a photon that has the right energy, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so you have a little bead known as a photon hitting a little bead known as an electron. Very good shot, by the way. You know, can imagine that photon just hitting that electron, which nobody can find around the <laughs> proton, right? It happens to hit it and kick it out, and now you have running current. And so it looks like the photon, according to Mr. Einstein at least, is something physical, okay? Because you have this bead hitting another bead. And now when you look it up, it says, no, it's a wave function. <laughs> okay. So what, hit, so what hit the electron, which is another wave function? <laughs> okay, so we have more wave functions here in all of these. Okay, give me a second here. Wave function on top of wave function. Okay, so uh, where do we go from this? Well, he ends up saying, uh, forget photons anyways. You know, forget them, throw them away. Especially forget photons as miniature cannonballs. So he's saying they're not beads. Okay, that's what he's saying. What undoubtedly does exist, meaning he's saying a photon doesn't exist, <laughs> is the electromagnetic field. Word field. Oh, field. Every time I hear field, I tremble. You know? uh, and this field interacts with other fields. Fields interacting with fields, love interacting with love, energy with energy, time with time, seconds with minutes, I guess, okay? Exchanging energy and momentum. So they exchange more concepts, okay? Is there an object called energy? Please draw it. I want to see it. What does it look like, okay? The electromagnetic field is a quantum field, okay? And we call these quanta photons. But what we actually observe, eyes, you know, is the electromagnetic field itself. I do envy his great vision. Uh, he is able to see fields. I haven't. Uh, I haven't, I guess, drank enough. <laughs> you look at field, another rabbit hole, a quantity, a quantity, a number, numbers, represented by a number, okay, that has a value for each point in space and time. That's what he's talking about. And he says he can observe it, he can see it, and he says that's what really a photon is, a field. So no matter whether you go with the wave function or <laughs> with a field, you end up with absolutely nothing. And yeah, I can see why he said at the beginning that he has trouble understanding, you know, physical concepts. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay, and uh, here he continues. He says, what is gravity? And he said, gravity is a tensor field, okay, that couples universally and minimally to all other fields. Okay, and so he clarifies that a tensor is determines how a field behaves, okay, and couples means does not distinguish between various forms of stuff, and universally means the tensor field plays a role in forming products and calculating volumes, blah, blah, blah. Okay, he didn't define the word field, which is the one we were waiting for. We don't know what a field is. That's the one he had to define. So we had to look it up, and it says, um, well, you know, uh, when you look up the word field, it's just a bunch of numbers that I just showed. And he ends up his, his article saying, it may take many more iterations before we happen upon the real answer. So he doesn't know what gravity is. After all that, he says all this. He, he, I think he makes money because he sends people to Patreon, and uh, so he gets donations. And he can't tell them what gravity is. He says, you got to wait. 100, what, 400 more years. We waited since Galileo and Newton, you know, 17th century scientific revolution. <laughs> and now we got to wait another 400 years. Maybe we'll find out what gravity is, you know, someday, you know. And again, this is like uh, the Klingon asking about the cat. He said, what is a cat? And uh, so he says, a cat is an animal that eats fish, meows, gets sick, sleeps, has kitties and poops. Okay. So he defines each one of these. He gives them an idea. What does he eat to pig out? What's meow to make noise, to sleep, to close your eyes? Great. Okay. But we want to know what the word animal means. And so he said, what's well, a bunch of particles? And you know, when you look at particles, you find out that particles are really numbers or maybe fields, and you're back to square one. And then he adds at the end, he said, it may take many more years before we find out what an animal is. <laughs> so that, that is the situation, folks. This is how mathematical physics explains everything. So we, we are very much familiar with all their so-called explanations of things out there. Why? Do we have this situation? Because they never define the words, especially the word object, the word thing. You can't do physics without a thing. And no mathematician ever discovered that from the days of the Greeks and before, all the way to Stephen Gawking and the rest of them today. Not one of them ever discovered how important the word object is to 
explain a mechanism to provide a physical interpretation. What they do is they use concepts. They move concepts around, mathematical concepts, and they think they're juggling balls. You know, when they're, all they're doing is, uh, in their dreams, they're moving concepts around. Okay, but uh, what's the issue today? Well, we've been, uh, we've been dealing with dark matter lately, and Mr. Toth, Toth has something to say about dark matter. Okay? He, in fact, he's quite heavily involved in dark matter, and that's why I chose him for the lecture today. And again, uh, he's just the uh, poster boy, uh, but he represents a whole army of people out there that do the same thing. Okay, and he is a prominent individual in the sense that he um, he's in Quora, he's uh, educating, you can say, or miseducating a new generation of people who read Quora, who go in there and ask questions. He answers them. Okay, and so what does Mr. Toth have to say about dark matter? Okay, and here it is, and he starts in one article. I think this was in Forbes. I'm not sure now. And some time ago, I think a couple years ago, and he says, the missing matter is called dark matter. Yeah, you see the little chart. That's not his, by the way. I, I pulled that out of some other place. The remaining stuff with negative pressure is called dark energy. So you can see dark energy is, what, 73% of the ignorance we have of the universe, and dark matter is only 23% of the ignorance. That's 96% of the ignorance that, not we, but the mathematicians, mathematicians have of the universe. Uh, the rest is what we can see, maybe even called touch, right? And uh, that's the, that small percentage there, that 4% remaining there, okay? <clears throat> okay, so that's where he starts. But he said, uh, all this is pretty solid, rigorous mathematics. Uh -huh. So what does mathematics have to do with things? Okay, we're talking about things here. He says it's rigorous because we have it mathematically down pat. Hmm. And then he ends up, <laughs> says, yet at the same time, we have not the faintest clue as to what these dark thingies really are. What a lesson. They have no clue what they're, they have, but it's been proven with mathematics. And so, yeah, you have the whole establishment out there. They believe in dark matter. They believe in the reality of dark matter. And why? Because they've proven it mathematically to exist. Now they tell the astronomer to look through his telescope and go look for it. And they ask the guy at the at CERN, Slack, and Fermilab to go out there and smash particles to see if he can produce dark matter, what? Particles. So we do know what dark matter is. They're particles. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? Yeah, they're particles. They're ultra-heavy particles that these people sprinkle around the outside of a galaxy to make the equations come out right that mimic the rotation of a galaxy. And so they're sprinkling all these goodies, these kilograms, they're sprinkling all these kilograms preferentially where they need them for the equation to come out right that describes the rotation of a galaxy. So we do know what dark matter is. They're little tiny particles that we can't see, and they're very ultra-heavy. Why they call them dark is, is the mystery. And it's a mystery because, as I showed you the other day, you can see right through them. Okay, you can see right through the dark uh, matter halo disk that spreads out way beyond a galaxy. Okay, the halo that's around a galaxy, you can see right through that and see stars in the background. So the word dark is not really the proper adjective. Maybe they should call it invisible or maybe translucent or transparent matter. That would probably be better, you know? So uh, what would they tell the guy at the accelerator? Look for dark matter. Oh, I can find that easily. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Look for transparent matter. Oh, I have trouble with that one. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to look for that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, and here he says, uh, he gives a, an idea here. He says, dark matter may be wimps. Okay, what are wimps? Weakly interacting massive particles. Okay. Um, particles, what are particles? Fields. What are fields? Nothing. Okay. Oh, we got that. Okay, but he continues, he says, this is important. Keep an eye on this one. He says, I believe that we need to find ways to, you know, actually detect these dark thingies before we can say anything definite about their nature. Uh -huh. uh, slightly trying to say something here? Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, right? But let's, blah, blah, blah. let's find out. And then there is the option that perhaps these dark thingies do not even exist. Oh, oh, this is blasphemy. Oh, they are mirages of sorts because we are doing the math using the wrong theory of gravity. What is Mr. Toth getting into here? What is he talking about? Uh, what am I supposed to understand from this? Well, I'll tell you what it's about. I'll tell you well, my, my personal impression of this. My, this is my take on this, okay? My impression is that Mr. Toth, like Mrs. Sabine Hossenfelder we talked about the other day, and like Mr. Milgram, uh, um, what is it? I can't remember the name, <laughs> uh, Jewish fellow who came up with MOND, the Modified Newtonian Dynamics. Okay? And all these people, they don't really believe in dark matter. 
Okay, and uh, I think Mr. Toth is there as well. Okay, he half believes, but he kind of doesn't believe because after 40 years we can't see it out there in the sky. It's translucent. It's heavily, heavily, heavy, uh, meaning meaning that it's ad hoc. It's put in there by hand. Remember? Showed you. Well, I'm going to get into that in a second here. But uh, they don't really believe that there's this dark matter. And so what do they believe in? Well, what's the alternative? Okay. It's interesting for what I'm going to talk about later, which is the pioneer pros, because it's the exact opposite in the case of the pioneer pros. There he believes the opposite. Okay. So here we go. Uh, he, he wrote on a couple articles. Okay. And what is he talking about? Well, he's proposing new equations for, um, uh, for how, how um, gravity works. So he's trying to modify, just like uh, Mr. Milgram did with Mond, and like Ms. Uh, Hassenfelder is trying to do with her group, in a dark matter group here in Germany. And what they do is they, they're saying that the equations need modifications. And in the case of um, Milgram, it was Ma Mond, and here they call it MOG. It's the modified uh, gravity. Okay? That's what they call it. Okay? He wrote two papers on this. Okay? You, you can look them up. Okay, so what do we have? Well, uh, he, I think he's an atheist or becoming an atheist or about to become one or uh, maybe he's an agnostic. I'm not sure what the uh, right qualifier is of dark matter. I don't think he believes much in dark matter. He's trying to find another solution. The solution is an equation. Okay? So they're trying to modify uh, gravity. Okay? And in a strange way, he is absolutely correct. <laughs> okay, so let's continue here. <laughs> That's the funny part. Here we have the dark matter conundrum, okay, that I talked about the other day. Okay, you can look it up in the previous videos. I'm just going to run quickly through this. What's the issue? The issue is that you have this, the final equation. I'm not going to go through the whole uh, derivation here. Uh, just look at the V for velocity. Forget about the squared. We're not interested in that. We're looking at this qualitatively, okay? So we have velocity, and it's equal to the GM, uh, gravitational constant, big mass, over uh, little r. I made it big. Why? Because the issue is that the farther a star is from the center of its galaxy, the slower it should go. And why is that the case? Because if you increase r, you can see what happens to v. Okay, v is going to go down. The velocity of that star has to go down. Okay, so if you increase the distance between the star and the center of the galaxy, the bigger you make r, the bigger you make that distance, the smaller will be your v. But that's not what we observe. When they put their telescopes out there and they uh, look at all these galaxies, what they see is that the stars on the outside go faster, or at the same speed or faster, right? To compensate for that, they created this Frankenstein monster known as dark matter, a big mass that they sprinkle preferentially on the outside of a galaxy, and they say, oh, with this mass, now we can explain why the galaxy rotates the way it does, okay? Because that's all we needed, that mass there to keep the, first the star from flying away. <laughs> we need to keep it there, you know, because the star flies away, uh, the, you know, from the galaxy, the galaxy would be throwing all these stars around, you know, like you coming out of a merry-go-round that's going at 100 miles per hour, okay? Spinning, <laughs> right? Orbiting. Okay, so they created this dark matter thing, and it has to be very big to compensate for the R in order for the little v not to get smaller for the little v to get bigger, if anything, okay? So that's the issue. What's the problem? Well, you can see that halo there around the galaxy, and that's the dark matter. That's the one they can't see. Is it dark? Well, no, it ain't. It's not uh, dark, and I'll tell you why. Because, see, take a look at that. Good look, and here it goes. You can see the stars right through the halo, like if the halo weren't there. That's the issue. So if you can see right through the halo of a galaxy, well, we shouldn't call it dark matter, because if it were dark, we would see a veil there. You know, we wouldn't see those stars. That's not the case, or galaxies. No, we see right through the halo, as if it weren't there at all. And this is what makes some people like, I think Mr. Toth, for sure, uh, uh, other people, uh, that maybe dark matter is a figment of our imagination. Maybe it's not real. Okay, that's the issue. Okay, so, uh, okay, they created this monster called dark matter, and now they told the astronomers, go look for it. <laughs> And they tell the people at the accelerators the same thing. Go look for it. Have something to do. Uh, earn your pay. Okay? Now these people are all busy receiving funds from you because most of it is public money. And what are they doing? They're looking for dark matter. They're looking for ghosts and angels. Go look for an, a ghost. Go look for an angel. And say, well, what does it look like? It's transparent. Oh, okay. I'll come back with it. <laughs> That's where we're at. Okay. And uh, how do we explain this in science? In physics, how do we explain this dark matter nonsense okay, that the mathematicians created, this monster? Okay, we start here, and we say that all atoms in the universe are physically interconnected. And I said physically interconnected. Okay, they're connected. Okay, 
We're not going to go into the details. We're just going to say they're physically connected right now. Think of them as strings, as uh, little uh, threads, whatever you want to call it. Okay. So unlike mathematical physics that deals with discrete particles and they cannot explain specifically the force of pull, okay, then uh, uh, which we can under the uh, rope model, as I call it, the rope hypothesis, all atoms being interconnected. Well, we can explain it with uh, we can explain pull because there is a physical connection. There is no actual action at a distance. Okay, it's just that we can't see or touch the mediators, and that's different uh, than saying that there is nothing there. And they say, well, you can't see or touch it, it's not there, it doesn't exist, it's not an object. And that's because they've always had the wrong definition, an irrational definition of the word object and of the word exist. And so we have to settle the language, we need to know what uh, we mean by object, by thing, and we need to know what we mean by exist. What is an object? That which has shape, not that which you can see or touch. You can't see or touch the table that's on the other side of the universe. See and touch require two objects, and um, uh, besides, it uh, involves motion, and motion and objects have to be def have to be defined before motion. Okay, so there's many arguments against the see touch criterion that the mathematicians have used now for what well, since at least since the days of the Greeks. Okay, that's what they use. That's why they go to the lab because they expect to see and touch, and you won't see or touch the mediators of Mother Nature. Here's a my famous test, okay? Take a pencil always in the presence of a relativist, okay? And you let go of it, and it falls down, okay? Do you see anything in contact with a pen or a pencil from above or below? No, you don't. And yet, this one doesn't, never falls to the ceiling. It always falls to the floor, always falls to the earth. And you say, well, it's impossible. We can't figure it out. You can't figure it out. There's only two objects, the pencil and the earth, two objects. You have only two objects, the moon and the earth. You have only two objects, the uh, sun and Jupiter. And you can't figure it out? It's so difficult? Well, it's difficult because you haven't seen the mediators. Why? Because the mediators are unseeable, untouchable. They're intangible, invisible. That's why. Not because they're not there. An object is that which has shape, not that which you can see or touch. That's where we start. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's the starting point for why we put these strings there, and what we're saying is there is no action at a distance. It's mathematics that does magic by doing action at a distance without mediators. That's why they're doing all their uh, mechanisms irrationally. Nobody can imagine whatever the mathematicians talk about because immediately they're going to introduce concepts. The field, energy, mass, time. We don't need any of that garbage. You can sweep all those words out of the dictionary. We don't need them in physics in, or in science. Okay, so how do we do it? If all atoms are physically interconnected, it's a piece of cake. This is baby stuff. It's for kindergartners. This dark matter thingy, the gravitate, the uh, uh, galaxy rotation problem, it's for babies. We don't, we don't even, it, it, you don't even have to spend two bits of brain on this thing. Okay, here it is. Okay, all uh, we start saying that all stars are physically connected because all atoms are physically connected. And that also explains why they all tend towards the center of a galaxy and why the rotation of the galaxy keeps them at bay. That's why a galaxy is shaped more or less like it's shaped. What do we do with this next? Well, we go in here and we put the uh, thing on top of a galaxy that is rotating. So all the stars in a galaxy are physically connected. Okay, they're connected by the electromagnetic ropes and those are the ones that mediate gravity as well. So we have the grand unified theory. Okay, and um, so from here, where do we go? Okay, well, here we have, uh, on top of that, we're going to put the magnetic field of the galaxy, which these people never place. They talk about it, but they never use it. Okay, here it is. And the uh, magnetic field of a galaxy extends way beyond the galaxy, way far out, okay, and it's powerful. What is the magnetic field? It's threads sweeping down, okay, uh, like in the sun. Okay, they go out one pole and come out and come into the other pole. Okay, that's what it is. These are threads that are swinging around a, a star, in this case, around a galaxy, also around the Earth. Okay, so we're talking about threads, physical threads that are coming down, okay going through uh, the center of whatever object, in this case, the galaxy. And uh, you'll hear about uh, jets because they say there's a black hole in the center of every galaxy. No, no, these people are confusing the magnetic field, if we'll call it that, okay, for brevity, and coming out of the, in this case, the North Pole of the galaxy and entering the South Pole. That's what we're talking about when they talk about jets, okay? There are no jets, okay? And, uh, yeah, one thing that you can visualize is that if you have three of these galaxies, okay, and here I just put three of them, they're magnetic fields that extend gazillions of miles, 
you know, from, from the object uh, could very well, um, uh, you know, uh, affect one another. In other words, they're uh, interacting with one another. And of course, where those magnetic fields interact, uh, we can see some very fancy stuff among them, you know, the so-called black hole. And I've talked about that in the past. I'm not going to deal with it right now. I just want to show that, you know, magnetic fields can interact because we're not talking about concepts. We're talking about physical objects. What are those physical objects? They are threads, threads of the rope. The bottom line or the uh, ultimate uh, underlying hypothesis is that there's a single thread in the entire universe, just a single closed loop thread, which turns into everything that is out there, that all the matter that exists in the universe. And uh, this thread turns into the rope, which is con which connects any two atoms, uh, torsion of which is what we call light, and it goes from one atom to another. Okay, and the atoms are made of the same thread. So everything in the universe is interconnected, not only interconnected, but everything in the universe is made of the same thread, of one thread, a closed loop thread. And there could be another universe, another body of matter made of another thread. We'll call it a parallel universe because it's probably the right concept, meaning that the space is the same for all of us, but the matter is not. None of those atoms in that universe are connected to any of the atoms of our universe. And the uh, funny thing about that, if these two universes were, were to cross each other, we can probably crash against one of their atoms, atom against atom, but we would not see them because we don't have a connection, the rope connection from that atom to our atom. We have no connection uh, uh, to see these atoms from our point of view. In other words, uh, the reason you see the Andromeda galaxy at night is because every atom in the Andromeda galaxy, every single one of them, is connected to the atoms of your eyes. Otherwise, we would not see the torsions moving along those existing mediators.